I don't know whether ever we'll be able to achieve that one ever, <laughs> but <laughs> inshallah, the other ones uh, are attainable. All right, uh, those are all <laughs> excellent answers. But uh, bef uh, before we get started, I would like to give everyone the opportunity to ask questions throughout the event. You could ask your questions in the chat box and we will address them to the panelists uh, as the event passes through. And I've kept everyone waiting for long enough now. I now have the pleasure of introducing our panelists for the evening. For today's event, our wonderful panelists are uh, Brother Sayyid Mahmoud Rizvi, uh, Sister Iman Barre, and Brother Adil Bashir. Uh, Brother Mahmoud Rizvi is currently a student at Harvard Law School and a, and a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow. Last year, Brother Mahmoud earned his Bachelor's of Arts in Government from UT Austin as the Dean's Distinguished Graduate. Working at Aiken Gump this past summer as a SEO Law Fellow, his clients included victims of human trafficking and battered spouses. As a founding member of AMBA, Mahmoud leads efforts to empower people to discover law school as their next career step and gain admissions into a JD program. Thank you for joining us today, Brother Mahmoud. Uh, our next panelist is Sister Iman Barre. Uh, Sister Iman graduated cum, la cum laude from New York Law School this past May. Prior to law school, she worked in fashion and journalism and chose to pursue a JD to help artists and communities of color protect culture through intellectual property law. Thank you for joining us as well, Sister Iman. And uh, lastly, we have Brother Adil Bashir, who is an assistant federal public defender and appellate supervisor for the Office of the Federal Public Defender of the Middle District of Florida. He has nearly a decade of experience litigating over 100 cases involving a complete array of issues across the Federal District Court, Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Court. Prior to joining the Defender's Office, Brother Adil worked as a litigation associate at Mayor Brown in Washington, D.C. He is a 2009 graduate of Jordan Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us as well, Brother Adil. And with that, uh, before we begin with the Q&A session and the discussion today, I'd like to mention that I myself, I'm a pre-law student, so I'll attempt to absorb as much information as I can while asking our panelists these questions, and I hope everyone can learn from this. So if our panelists are ready, uh, we can, if we can begin asking our first questions, we can go uh, turn by turn. At, the order of my screen right now is uh, Brother Adil, Sister Iman, and uh, Brother Mahmoud. So if that order works for everyone, uh, inshallah, we could get started. So my first question is, many students struggle to decide whether law school is really meant for them. Uh, many times there's, uh, there's confusion on what your career path is one, what you want to be, and you contemplate law school as one of them. So what were your motivating factors and how did you become interested in going to law school, Brother Adil? Well, uh, assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you everyone for um, having me. And yes, as uh, the chat box just uh, says, feel free to throw in your questions as, as we're speaking um, here this evening. Uh, the first thing that, that I would say uh, to everybody here and what motivated me, for many of you that are thinking about law school right now or thinking about the possibility I certainly would place myself in the category of um, someone who never thought he would go to law school. Uh, my whole life I had spent uh, in STEM. I went to undergrad with the full intention of studying science, um, following very traditional path, um, in, as is in a, a lot of our cultures, um, especially uh, immigrant uh, culture here in America. And really, and I think that a major theme of this evening that um, you know I'll try to emphasize is with the experience of mentors that I experienced in undergrad um, that really guided me and said, uh, you know, you, you should take your passions, your talents, your interests, and um, you know, you would do well um, in the legal field, even if you don't know what you're going to do. The law, a legal degree, is is quite versatile, and you'll hear probably from the rest of the panelists, which I'll. Let's speak in just a moment. Um, when I started my law school career, just like when I started my undergrad career, I had no idea that I would end up where I am today and I couldn't be happier where I am today and what I'm doing. So keep an open mind, um, but you really wanna try to leverage the best of your talents, but find those people that will inspire and push you and not stand in your way um, and, and really are gonna 
guide you into being the best version of yourself. Thank you for that, Brother Adil. Uh, Sister Iman. Um, so I actively tried to not go to law school for most of my life. Like I really did not want to be an attorney. I went to journalism school, I went to fashion school. I have a clothing line. Um, I had a show at New York Fashion Week during my first semester of 1L. And law school was just that thing that kind of always like everyone in my life really pushed me towards. Um, typical immigrant parents, older brother's a doctor and the second child. So it was like, well, doctor's gone. So you have to be, you know, the attorney is like the last thing left. Um, but I didn't know what was possible with being an attorney. I thought it was going to be working for corporations or being a public defender. And I have like brother deal, um, all the jaws and respect for you because that's something that I just feel like it's so such important work, but I would be crying every single day. And I just, I don't think I could ever do it. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do something with people that made a positive impact. So I started working with um, clothing lines that like trying to ethical, ethically manufacture clothing lines to create employment opportunities for women. And then I kept running into all of these really frustrating legal issues that I did not have the basis to understand or the pockets to hire an attorney, um, specifically around cultural appropriation. I worked with Teen Vogue for a number of years and Vogue and I wrote a, like a ton of articles on appropriation, but it's, you're constantly rewriting the exact same thing and I needed to find a way to like find a solution. So I went to law school not to be an attorney, but basically to help people own culture. And it's understanding that there are so many things you can do with the law. And sometimes it's just finding your passion, finding the way that the legal profession fits into it. Uh, I'm not currently working at a law firm. Um, I'm actually working at a law firm, but through their PR side and developing software for to help uh, make like intellectual property laws more affordable for minority artists. So in the law, but not really practicing. Thank you for that. That's uh, such a motivating uh reason to be in law. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, Brother Mahmoud. Sure. Um, I guess pretty similar to Brother Adil. Uh, you know, when I was born, I had two options, either become an engineer or a doctor. Uh, and I didn't really vibe with either of those. Uh, I just found them to not be necessarily fascinating. I just felt like, you know, maybe that was just something I wouldn't necessarily excel in. Uh, so I wanted a um, you know, a field that would kind of cater more to my strengths um, and that, you know, I would be able to excel in. And then I, I felt like that would be pretty rewarding. Uh, I'd be like, you know, I'd be lying to say that, but I didn't think about uh, the financial aspect of it as well. Um, you know, as like belonging to a community that's facing 70% unemployment, like uh, most blind Americans that you'll meet uh, are not employed. Uh, I wanted to, you know, tool myself with um, you know, a degree and a uh, career path that would guarantee, you know, my financial stability if I want to have a family one day and be able to support them. Uh, and I think for all of us to, you know, uh, I think most of us on this call are probably first generation Americans. Um, so we don't have access to generational wealth or uh, financial stability like our, um, you know, our, a, a lot of our counterparts who have been here for many generations. So I would say that uh, one, it was something that I felt like I would be able to do well in and to uh, something that I knew I'd be able to uh, support myself financially and my family financially with. So, and I've ended up now absolutely enjoying it and like really loving it, so. Thank you, Brother Mahmoud. I think what we gathered from all three responses were no matter what the traditional path of going through your college experiences, uh, the law, could you could really pivot in the direction of law and we've seen that the results uh, turn out to be, that they have a positive outcome. Uh, along the lines of what Sister Iman said, uh, like how Sister Iman is utilizing her JD degree in a different format, uh, how, how would you describe the process of thinking about law school? As in, do we limit and confine ourselves to the typical image of law school, or is there more that can be attained through the law school or the degree on its own? Uh, we could go in the same order, brother. Do you? Well, <clears throat> and and I really would piggyback. Well, first I'd say to Sister Iman, um, I I laugh to keep from crying on a daily basis because <laughs> it does. I'd be lying if it didn't. Uh, if the work doesn't weigh on you, um, 
and that more than anything else will keep you motivated on any aspect of life. Um, you know, sometimes uh, the process is a struggle, but um, it's, it's worth it if you're if you're doing and pursuing your passion. Um, I think you know when you're when you're thinking of the typical law school experience, you have to understand that um, it's not going to be easy. Um, and it's not meant to be easy, but it's a means to an end more than anything else. And like most things in life, what you make of it. Uh, I think um, all of us would probably agree that, you know, you want to try to take as advantage and we're at different stages of the law school process of, you know, the relationships that you make, the people that you meet, um, and really the types of uh, fields that you pursue. You may not like something um, and you can pivot in a different direction. Um, I'm certainly doing something different than I did in my 1L summer um, and, and otherwise. I, I would really encourage everyone to keep an open mind and think more about, are you the type of person that likes to learn and likes to um, be able to utilize and be a problem solver uh, when you reach other aspects of your career? Because being able to pivot is gonna be crucial um, as you go forward. So you're not doing something that you just pigeonholed or thinking you have to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, sister Iman. I think for me, it was really about understanding how many options there are out there and really acknowledging that like all of us have, like Allah SWT gave all of us our own gifts and our own strengths and our own talents and all of that's going to fit into the legal profession. You don't need to be like the lawyers you see on TV or be, um, you know, like the type of lawyer that you have in your community. You can really make it your own. I think during 1L, they try to beat that out of you, <laughs> both in the way that you think and pretty much like everything. Um, but understanding that like in order to know what type of law you want to practice or how you want to use your JD or if you, if you even want to go to law school, you need to live your life. Like you need to actively be engaged in community work, um, in relationship building, in understanding who you are as a person, what you contribute, what makes you happy. And that's how you're going to be the best you know, the best person, the best Muslim, best professional, best lawyer, best whatever it is, really just building that relationship with yourself first and going from there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. So um, I think a JD is such a versatile degree and that when I look at people who have graduated from law school and what they're doing, uh, there's, there's so much more than just the traditional legal path of like actually practicing law. Uh, you know, you have people who are Fortune 500 CEOs because they're really good at like risk analysis, like weighing liabilities. And, um, and then you also have, I don't have the exact stats, but I mean, if you look at Congress and you look at the Senate, uh, a huge majority of them, right, have JDs or like this two cities that I've uh, been living in over the last few years, like Austin, Texas and Houston, Texas, both of those mayors, they have JDs, right? Um, so I think that it's a really versatile degree, whether you want to go into academia or what have you. Um, so like my personal passions, like outside of, you know, just trying to put bread on the table is I've been in the disability advocacy space for the last five, six years. Um, so I have a lot of attorneys that I worked with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we are doing a lot of disability advocacy lobbying, uh, on Capitol Hill and like they're writing policy because they're like phenomenal writers and like they're really persuasive. So we would like go meet with um, legislators uh, on the Hill and like try to push certain like bills for like greater access to employment and education and such. So uh, like a, a JD is so versatile. So I really don't think like, you know, um, if, you're, if you're good at utilizing, you know, the tools that are in your box, I don't think it's something that you can re really regret uh, getting. And I think it can definitely be like a really, really great, uh, uh, you know, platform to build your future on, so. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that really reflected how, uh, as Brother Mahmoud said, how versatile uh, JD is and how it could be applied in so many different fields. Uh, moving on, uh, so what, uh, we can dive right into the application process. I think uh, the past two questions would have convinced me. Uh, it's an excellent uh, to see how, how versatile and how, uh, how many things uh, JD can enable you to do. Uh, if Brother Mahmoud, you could quickly uh, just run over the different parts of the application process, the different components, uh, so our so everyone listening can have a fair idea of what uh, the application process and the 
whole application. Sure, too. sure. Yeah, so just to simplify it as much as we possibly can, um, I would have two categories, right? Like your hard and your soft elements of the application. So your hard uh, elements are going to be your numbers, right? So that's your GPA and your LSAT score. Um, and then you have your soft elements, which are your personal statement, diversity statement, resume, letters of recommendation, et cetera. Uh, and I'm not sure how deep you want me to go into these, um, Mir, but uh, if we want to talk like a little bit about the hard elements, uh, it's really unfortunate. I wish admissions were more holistic than they actually are. I think some schools are a little bit more holistic than others. Um, but, you know, I think what it is that they're all in like this chase, you know, to get certain rankings and such. And part of that formula that U.S. News or these other entities use is like the GP and LSAT scores of um, the students that they're admitting. So I would say that a good platform, you know, to kind of build your application upon is having like, you know, a solid foundation, having uh, a solid GPA and a solid LSAT score. If you don't have that, it's not a big deal, right? There's certain schools that are even splitters. Like if you, if the LSAT's just not clicking, you have a really good GPA, um, that could really help you out. Or like, you know, things are going on and like your GPA is not super solid, then, you know, maybe retaking the LSAT, that could really help. I know uh, one thing that really helps out with is scholarships as well, uh, especially LSAT scores can really help out with scholarships and uh, application fee waivers because applying to schools can get really expensive. So I know for me, um, I really worked my butt off with the LSAT. So I was able to apply to a lot of different schools through an application fee waiver process. Um, so I didn't have to like pay for the application itself. And then going on to the soft uh, elements, you know, I don't think we have enough time to go delve into each individually. I say, I, I think all of them, like your personal statement, diversity statement, what other supplemental essays you um, include in the application, like certain schools will have like a why Berkeley law um, essay that they want you to write, like why you want to go to that school specifically, your resume and your letters of rec. I think all of them should tell a cohesive, strong narrative uh, and a strong story because that's what admission counselors are going to really, um, you know, remember. And I think every school is looking for somebody who's going to walk through their doors and in three years graduate and uh, like make their school look good, right? So I think most schools are looking for people who have uh, a dedication towards creating a positive social impact um, in their communities and around the world. So like, you know, doing work like Brother Adil and Brother uh, Sister Iman are doing now with, with their uh, JDs, you know, like I'm sure their law school they're being like okay like you know that was a smart decision letting them in because now like we can say you know sister iman graduated from our law school and now she's like uh working on equity within like fashion and the clothing industry and like brother adil is like a public defender you know so i i think kind of telling a strong story that compels them to really understand uh how you're gonna graduate from their school and make them look good ultimately so Thank you so much. It was thank you for diving into the application process. Uh, uh, I'd like to touch upon you mentioned the personal. Uh, there's sometimes a little bit of confusion around the personal statement. Uh, I'd like to ask, how did you navigate uh, through the personal statement? Uh, and also, should you always address the typical why law school question on the personal statement, or could you uh, navigate through other avenues? Uh, we could start with Brother Adil and. Or however, Brother Mahmoud, you could go and then we could. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead, Brother. So I probably have some specific advice about this and, and really picking up on um, what Brother Mahmoud was just talking about. It, it's going to serve you well in every aspect of life to think about thematics and how you can present yourself. You're going to go to a job interview. It's going to be a pitch of what, who you are. If you're talking to somebody, giving them the elevator pitch. Um, you may be sitting there thinking right now, well, you know, it's easy if you have a really good LSAT score, and really good GPA, you know, talk to how many people have those and have not gotten into their dream school. You, you, becoming a well-rounded person and a well-rounded applicant takes a little bit of effort to realize doing the things that you're passionate about and how you want to put it forward. Um, all that also is in, in the effort of trying to stand out a bit. You don't want to be monolithic. So, um, when I did my personal statement, um, 
I actually did a first person narrative of um, my senior year or my, uh, yeah, my senior year of undergrad. Um, I had the privilege of going on Hajj with my mother. Um, it was a very impactful moment in my life. Um, and I wrote a narrative um, from my perspective of doing Dwarf. Um Had absolutely nothing to do with law school whatsoever. Um, but um, as you can imagine, I tried to put myself into the story and tell um, a version to, of a law school of my own thoughts and feelings um, and emotions of going through that period of time. Um, I only share this not in any, um, you know, patting myself on the back, but more than one law school admissions counselor reached out to me to just say, thank you for writing something different. <laughs> We really enjoyed reading something different. And it, and that was intentional too. You know, I had gotten the same advice of do something that reflects who you are. 99% um, of your peers will write something that they want to, you know, save the whales, um, which deserve saving or, um, you know, going into public defense, which I, I can assure you is a lot more complicated than, you um, you know, the, the noble cause where it seems like, or, you know, will be not reflective of what they're actually accomplished. You know, they have this passion to save the world, except, you know, they've only ever taken high paying jobs in the past and their entire resume is built to, you know, go into finance or something without dem demonstrating. So it's, it lacks authenticity, not to say that any of that is bad, but um, I think true writing also um, reflects uh, who you are as a person and can put that down on paper. And that's something that will also serve you well as you go forward and, you know, your legal careers, especially if you go in, into writing. So authenticity and trying to stand out, but finding your own voice, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I'll end, end by saying, because it's something I keep in the forefront of my head. One of my great mentors and first bosses always told me the best writers and the best editors are the ones that help you bring out your own voice and don't change what you're trying to do. And it's the same as a person, someone who helps you bring out who you are rather than try to shape you into who they want you to be. Um, Thank, you. So, Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I, I realized that there was a little leg and I cut you off. Um, for myself, the law school application process was not, okay, let me backtrack a couple of things. First, I'm just gonna say it is a numbers game, unfortunately. Um, LSAT and GPA really do matter as much as schools really like to tell you that they're holistic. They aren't going to be unless you're like, they will be to an extent, but the LSAT is something that is learnable. So do your, like as best as you can to give yourself time to, practice to get like getting to the score that you need um, and apply early give don't make this application process more difficult on yourself get things in early if you're getting things in too late or you want to write the LSAT again apply the following year one year isn't going to make that much of a difference except for when it comes to things like scholarships and like actual things like it's like a year of your life of not going to law school yes but you could be saving yourself two hundred thousand um, dollars another thing uh in a lot of our communities um until our um, learning disabilities aren't really addressed. Um, so I know in my entire life that I have ADHD. I did not get any sort of accommodations for the LSAT. Um, and I'm sharing this in the event that if somebody does struggle with test taking or anything like that, don't make this harder on yourself because those accommodations exist for you for a reason. Um, take the time to give yourself the chance to do your absolute best. And that means working with your brain instead of working against you know, your natural thought process and thinking ability. Um, and when it comes to, uh, so I'm a writer. So the cover letter was where I was like, uh, or the uh, personal statement was where I was like, I'm gonna go all out. Like this is, I can't fix my GPA from undergrad, um, but I can really like tell my story here. Um, I quoted Tupac. <laughs> I was very like, <laughs> this is who I am, this is very transparent. Um, and Mahmoud, I laughed when you said like, my school would like, you know, brag about me to an extent because I'm pretty sure my school hates me um, because yeah. last year when protests were happening in New York and no law schools were doing anything I wasn't I would not I'm not the kind of person to be comfortable sitting in silence with that I emailed my dean 
Um, and then when my dean didn't respond, I got every law school in the Northeast to send letters to their deans and like start a petition to get some sort of legal resources on the ground. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's like you need to be yourself through the entire process because even though like maybe shot myself in the foot when it comes to references and little things like that, I know that I did by Islamic duty, by doing the right thing and using my law degree in ways that actually matter to me. Um, plus I quoted Tupac, they knew what they were getting when they let me into their school. So um, yeah, be yourself the entire process because you wanna be somewhere that honors and respects what's important to you. Um, all schools say they care about diversity, but start talking to the students um, and not just um, like student organizations that you um, resonate with, talk to, talk to all of them really. You wanna see how all students feel supported at, at school. Um, look at what they did during the pandemic. Look at how they handled mental health. The, like these three years are going to be so consuming and so important that you wanna be somewhere where you can absolutely thrive. Like you don't wanna come out of law school traumatized even though most of us probably did. <laughs> Um, just set yourself up for success in every way that you can. And that starts with being honest with what's important to you. Thank so you. Uh, my take on the personal statement is that uh, tell some, tell an interesting story that people are going to remember and the admissions counselors are going to remember. And a lot of people will be like, oh, I have nothing interesting to talk about. Uh, I think pretty much every single person on this call, and somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, is like a first generation American. So we all have amazing stories of what our parents and grandparents have to go through and, you know, settling here and establishing ourselves here in the United States and getting to the point where we can even think about applying to law, law school. I know the whole process was so emotional for my family and I, because we never even thought we would be like in this position. Like, I remember when I got in, we were all just like crying, like nonstop, just because like, you know, so... Um, the only reason I mentioned that is I just think we all have really powerful stories to tell, even if we think we don't. Uh, and then in regards to, you know, say you feel like you haven't done enough interesting stuff, go out and do interesting stuff that's not generic, right? Like, I'm not saying don't get involved on campus, but everybody was like, you know, the vice president of their MSA on campus. Like, uh, me personally, I just don't find that super fascinating, right? Or like, I, I again, I, not to downplay being a paralegal, but I'm sure it's a great experience and plus you get paid and like, et cetera, et cetera. And like, you can learn a lot of legal terminology. I just don't find that like super fascinating. I, I don't, I can't imagine myself being an admissions counselor and seeing somebody who was a paralegal, which I guess would be a positive indicator that they're interested in law, but that's not going to be like, wow, that's really cool. Like go out and do something really different, really cool. Something that's not on your campus, like not traditional like just something that the admissions counselors are going to look at and just be like wow like this person's really cool and like they're really interesting they're willing to take a risk and like you know make themselves um more rounded and give themselves like cool life experiences and especially if you can find something that you're really passionate about like for me it was really easy right like me getting involved with blindness advocacy was selfish because like the better the state of blind americans uh is like the better my life is right so like like Honestly, if it comes down to some, some people are like, oh, wow, like you do all this blindness advocacy work. I'm like, yeah, it's purely selfish because like if I can break down more barriers for the overall blind community, that means there's more barriers broken down for me as well. So um, for me, it was easy. It was like kind of handed to me, but like go out and just like try different things and do interesting stuff. And like, so you can be able to, you know, have a really cool looking resume and have like a really awesome uh, personal statement. So also uh, one thing I would say is that, um, View your personal, I, this is just how I view writing in general. I view it as like an art form. Uh, so like, because when you read like a really solid piece of writing, it'll be like, wow, like this is beautiful, you know? Um, so really spend time on like really delving into the art of that piece as well. Because again, you want the admissions counselor, they've already read a thousand other essays, right? Like you want them when they pick up your essay to just be like, wow, like this is beautiful, you know? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brother Mahmoud. Uh, and I'd like to uh, jump to another component of uh, the application, uh, which is the letter of recommendation. Uh, so many times uh, there's speculation on the, whether there's a sweet number, whether 
all your rec recommenders should be through academic sources or there should be a professional source. So if you all could give uh, us some input on that as well, please, Brother Adil. Yeah, so, you know, the, I think uh, another thing that is emerging here is a little bit about authenticity um, and, and finding, you know, the law school process is probably a lot more about finding yourself. And so when you emerge out of it, you're also um, a whole person. Um, I found, you know, the relationships um, with certain professors, maybe professors you TA'd with that you work for. Um, again, and, you know, I was coming from the science field, so really none of them had any, um, you know, background um, per se in law. Um, I did have an economics professor, but, you know, to Brother Mahmoud's point, you know, we would do Meals on Wheels together. Um, and, uh, you know, he, you know, we would often have lunch up at the one uh, Pakistani restaurant in Binghamton, New York, um, because he thought it was interesting and wanted to <laughs> um, try some uh, different cuisine. Um, building your relationships is going to be the, a really helpful thing in terms of letters of recommendation. The last thing any professor wants, I, I can even fast forward um, in my current state now, um, you know, I, I teach adjunct at law school, I teach legal writing. Um, I, we have interns at our job. People are always asking for letters of recommendation and you want to be as accommodating as possible. But from this side of the coin, I can tell you um, you're enthusiastic about do, doing it for someone who has you know, sought out, you've had a relationship with and you want to see succeed. If it's somebody who you don't really even know that well and you have to provide them or they have to provide you with all sorts of information, you know, you can just imagine how much effort or how well that letter is going to come off and looking. And if someone picks up the phone to call and, you know, get a reference, um, you know, be somewhat mindful and understanding too. When people give recommendations, they have their brand that they're trying to, you know, preserve as well. You know, who are they, you know, really putting forward and, um, you know, and wanting to put their stamp of approval on. And um, for some people, it's, it's not that hard, but for others, um, you know, these, these are just real aspects of, uh, you know, the, the letter of recommendation process. So, um, you know, you can go back, you can just try to get, you know, certain academics, but people who know who you are and who can vouch for, you know, the skill sets and, you know, the things that you're going to be able to do um, to really, you know, you know, put you over the edge. But those relationships is what I, I really emphasize. Thank you, uh, Brother Sister Iman. Um, so, I, again, wanted to stand out in ways that I knew, like I needed to make up for a not so great GPA. Um, so I had, I specifically looked for people who could tell stories about me that would add to my application. I didn't want someone who talked about how well I paid attention in class or cause I really mean class or not. <laughs> I'm not that kind of student. Um, so I actually, I went with the Dean of my journals in school um, and he talked about the investigative work that I did as a, as a journalism student, um, specifically a story that I did on um, my school was partnering with uh, a university in occupied Palestine. And I wanted my law schools to know like my politics up front because I wasn't going to be pretending for three years. Um, and he wrote basically how I, told the story, like it found the story, told the story and how I use activism as a journalist and how that would translate into the law. Um, and then I had my first boss as an intern. Um, and I remember like maybe day three of my internship, I asked if I could use the company credit card to file a FOIA request um, because there was an investigative story that I really wanted to do. And I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Like I thought, I'm like, let me do good journalism. Um, and then two weeks later, another, you, he obviously said no to this. I was like a 21 year old kid. Who, why would he give me the company credit card? Um, and then a couple of weeks later, another news organization broke the story that I had been working on. Um, and I couldn't finish because I couldn't get the FOIA request in. And I forwarded it to him and I was like, next time, just trust me. And it was like a little, like we had a good relationship, but it was like a little bit, maybe a little bit bolder than I would be now. Um, and he told that story and I asked him, like I sent him basically a draft of what I wanted him to say. And I included that because I wanted to highlight certain qualities that I knew I had. Um, and then my last, uh, my last reference was the late Kate Spade. Um, she was one of my mentors in fashion. She took me to my first New York Fashion Week show. Um, 
And she was just somebody who always um, inspired me, believed in me. Like I'm, I'm Canadian also. I'm from the middle of nowhere, literally the middle of nowhere, Canada, above North Dakota. Um, and just showing that like this amazing designer was willing to invest in me and like kind of like teach me the ropes so early on in my career. Um, so no one to talk about how great of a student I was, but everyone's talked about all the other aspects of like who I am as a person that I thought could make up for the weaker parts of my application. Um, so be strategic and don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Um, and really think about the relationships that are authentic because they're reading tons of reference letters from political studies professors, they're bored, like give them something that is like an actual story about you that's going to um, add more flavor to their, um, their, the classroom that they put together, or the class that they put together for that year. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Adir Mahmoud. So I would say with um, the letters of rec, it's kind of like finding a balance because some people will chase after people in high positions to get them to write them a letter recommendation. And, you know, law school admissions counselors are going to be able to tell that this person really has no idea who you are. And they just gave you a letter of rec to be nice uh, because you asked for it. And like, you just happen to be a constituent. Like, so don't call like your local congressman and be like, Hey, can I have a letter of recommendation for law school? Unless you work for them. Right. Um, and like, they actually know you really well. And they're going to like write you a genuinely good letter. But also don't like go to your neighbor, Bob, who knows you super well, but the law school doesn't care who the heck Bob is, right? So I would say like, there's kind of that balance between, um, you know, somebody who like, whose uh, letter would uh, hold value to like the law school, but then also somebody who like can really tell a genuine story about like who you are as a person and like why you're an asset to that school. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, all the soft elements of the application are one narrative, right? So you want people who are gonna like write letters about you that know about your work, right? And uh, you can obviously tell them like, hey, I'm writing my personal statement about this. I'm putting um, like this information on my resume or alternatively, a lot of my recommenders said, hey, send me your resume or send me your personal statement or send me both. So that it's all one cohesive piece, right? Because say your personal statement says like, oh, I'm really passionate about all these things, but none of those things are on your resume. And then your recommender talks about like you having passions that are completely opposite of what's on your personal statement, right? So then this kind of like raises red flags. So uh, I just think I wanted to emphasize the point that this is all one narrative, like the soft part of your application from the essays to the resume to the letters, like they should all tell like, a similar story about who you are and like what you're striving to become. Thank you. I think uh, with all the responses we gathered that it's uh, best if you have a cohesive and an authentic approach to the whole soft uh, section of the application. Uh, I wish we had more time to dive into everything, but I would like to ask a question which sums up uh, pretty much all of it. Uh, in your experience, uh, what were the most difficult parts of the application process and how were you able to overcome those difficulties? So we could go for the view. Um, no, I think, you know, I think the difficulty is exactly um, what uh, all of us are really talking about is really trying to discover and figure out what that theme and that narrative is gonna be. You know, if you, you know, if you got a one, 70 and a 40, you know, you're, you know, the rest of it, quite frankly, could be, you know, as long as you're not completely a one dimensional person, um, you, you know, you'll probably do fine, but you may have other aspirations. And it's not like these schools, there's lots of people out there that have, um, maybe not lots, but, um, you know, I think it's also a combination of, you know, putting it all together. I think a lot, of, you know, I've come across, you know, in full disclosure too, um, you know, I worked uh, for Kaplan for four years um, during undergrad and throughout law school teaching LSAT and doing coaching for, um, you know, uh, law school admissions. I would, you know, come across people all the time that were, um, what Sister Amon was just talking about, were hesitant about what they wanted because they thought, you um, you know, they just didn't have the grades or they didn't have the LSAT or something. Um, and I always used to tell them, you know, let somebody else throw your application out. Don't self-select yourself out of the process. Um, don't, 
typecast yourself into what you think society or the world wants you to be, you need to figure that out first, because if you don't know, then how is anyone else going to know? Or, and, or they'll pick for you. Um, and you may not be happy with what they end up um, picking for you. Um, so, you know, it's, I found a lot of students would have um, what I call, you know, it's essentially a fear of failure, really. Um, and it's very difficult to get over. It'll follow your entire life and it's a totally natural feeling. Um, but to get over that and really be methodical, you know, the things that we're talking about is you want to be able to figure out, well, here are my strengths, here are the things that I need to fill in the gaps. And you know, being authentic with yourself. If there are certain, you know, for myself, um, you know, there's things that I knew I needed to work on. Um, I, you know, um, am not a naturally gifted writer, um, unlike some of my panelists, which I envy. The I really, I really do. It's something, and I and people laugh because I literally that's all I do in my job is write, <laughs> and I teach writing and. Um, but it's, it actually does not come very easy to me. It's something that I work really, really a lot on to get better at as you go over time. It's okay to do that. You have to be honest with yourself about the things that you need to work on. And then, you know, if you really want to get good at something, um, you know, do that as well. So it's the same thing with the LSAT. You know, I can't tell you the number of people that came through my class that were starting in the 120s and 130s. And I promise if you take anything away about the LSAT, it is such an, it is a learnable test. Um, it is, trust me, I, I, I actually, I was, you know, 2008 teacher of the year. I can, I have full authority to say this. It is a joke once you realize how patterned the exam is. Um, you can put effort in and I can't promise you'll ace it, but you can learn it and you can get a pattern at it. And it's, it's not designed to do anything else except for learn how well you take that test. Um, so you can get there, don't get discouraged. Um, and that's really kind of the, the heart of the whole process. Don't get discouraged. Thank you. Other than Daily took my answer is the not self-sabotaging, really believing in yourself. Um, for myself personally, I wish I wish I listened to myself more during the application process. I wish I trusted myself more. Um, I feel like when you know, it's like even like making die, like when you know, when in your heart you're praying for something, but you don't believe it's actually gonna happen, like why would Allah give it to you? So like you really need to go out there and be like best foot forward, absolutely believe in yourself, know that like what's meant for you is gonna happen um, and approach things with 100% confidence. I say that now. And I'm still trying to practice that now much easier to say than actually do. Um, but I wish I relied on my faith a lot more and didn't um, essentially sit myself out. Like it's when you allow yourself to like fall victim to uh, imposter syndrome, you start making sloppy mistakes that you wouldn't normally. You start handing in applications that have mistakes. You put the wrong school on things. And that's really just like your subconscious mind tricking you into setting yourself out of something that you, you know, most likely could have achieved. Um, and ultimately, like no one knows you as well as you know yourself. Um, yeah, sorry, my, my niece is like crawling around the floor handing me fries. So if you guys hear noise, that's her. I don't know why she's doing this right now. Um, but just really, I, I'm very close to my family. I always, you know, I listen to my family for pretty much everything as I'm sure most of us do. But my parents aren't lawyers. My parents didn't go to law school. My parents don't actually know anything about the admissions process. I, so I, I know it's really lame to talk about your law, your LSAT score when you're done uh, law school. I got a 169. I started with a 144. Like I worked really hard for that 169. I'm not a naturally gifted test taker. And then I applied to law school in May. That makes no sense. <laughs> that is like the worst thing that you could do to yourself. But my parents were so concerned that I was, I, I went to law school when I was 26. They're like, you're going to be 27 when you start. You're going to be too old. When are you going to get married and have a family? All of these things. Just go to law school. Jokes on them. I'm still single. No kids. Done law school. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, but that, with the grades or this resume that I had, the reference letters that I had, the LSAT score that I had, had I just waited 
a year and applied in September when applications opened, I would have been in a much better position. Now, alhamdulillah, I don't actually, I don't want to work in big law, so T14 or not doesn't make that much of a difference to me, but it gives you options. So if you're somebody who doesn't know for sure what you want to do, be, be the, like, hand in your application when you were the best version of you, right? Like hand in the best piece of paper that you can, whether it means sitting out a cycle or investing in um, uh, a prep course or something. Um, yeah, I think I think that's all. I don't even remember what the question is. I just rambled, so I'm gonna pass it off to. <laughs> yeah, so for the hardest parts of the application, uh, not to discourage anybody, but I felt like I just suffered through the entire thing. Um, just because like Iman, you referred to uh, accommodations earlier. If anybody needs help fighting for accommodations, like I'm your guy. Like I had to fight it out with LSAC for so long to get an accessible exam. And then like, even when I got to my exam, um, LSAC themselves don't administer the exam. They contract out to like these test proctoring companies. So I show up and they don't know anything about my accommodations. So they're trying to call LSAC and my exam's like on a Saturday. So nobody at LSAC is going to pick up the phone on a Saturday. So yeah, sorry not to go into it. But like, yeah, so like from my exam to like everything, I just found it to be super stressful. And I think Iman really hit the nail on the head. Give yourself time. Um, don't hold yourself to these arbitrary deadlines. Like do it properly rather than quickly. One thing, really quick example. I wrote one personal statement and I was planning on just changing it up a little bit and submitting it to every school. And then I went into like every little school's module on the LSAC portal and every single school had different word requirements. And I was like, oh my God. So for like one school, I'd have to cut it like in half. And anybody who is like written way too much and they have to cut it in half, you know how hard that can be, like trying to preserve like the story that you've told, but like you're like, combing through this essay a thousand times to like okay I can take out one word there comb through it again okay I can take out another word there and like you literally do that like a, so many times until you can get the essay short enough or they've given you more space you're like okay now what do I add to this so I think uh the whole process can take a lot longer than you realize like giving yourself your time to like really perfect the LSAT LSAT as well um and then I know, so like I, I had the means to be able to invest like in Kaplan, um, but I know a lot of people don't. Um, so just like a random tip, I know Amir, you didn't ask about this, but um, like a lot of schools will have different scholarships that you can apply for specifically for uh, being able to get like a certificate to take a Kaplan course, or even certain law firms will fund you, um, you know, to take a Kaplan course or Princeton Review or whatever, like these other LSAT uh, prep courses are. And then um, another little thing, quick thing too, as well, is that it's completely dependent on you, what your future is going to look like. And yes, your law school can help you to a certain degree. So of course, I would encourage you to go to a more resource law school. But if that doesn't happen, I don't think that's going to hold you back. Like I've met people who have done incredible things and have gone to law schools that you've never heard of in your entire life. Um, and even if you do want to go into big law, I know there is the perception that you can only break into big law if you go to like the T14 or like top 20. But even this past summer, I was at a very large corporate law firm uh, that does like, you know, everything that you would think a big law firm does like private equity and complex corporate litigation, et cetera. And there was people there who were like making a ton of money and again, they were from law schools that you would have never heard from. I think they definitely had to hit the pavement a lot more than their counterparts and had to really like grind and struggle to be able to break through that glass ceiling and get in. But at the end of the day, they were there, right? Um, even on partner panels that we've heard previously in AMBA, uh, partners at like huge law firms, uh, they were working at like a smaller law firm that got bought up by a larger law firm. So like they they were able to break in that way or like they went and worked at a smaller law firm, gained that experience and then broke into a large law firm. So I think whatever you want to do, um, of course, better law school could help you out, but it's not going to limit you. You just have to be hungry. So uh, honestly, yeah, I would just say the biggest thing is stay hungry um, and stay hopeful. And like, if you ever need a vent or just like scream about the LSAC or LSAT, either or like that's 
why we're here. Like, shoot me a text, call me, email me. Like, I'm more than happy. Since I hated the whole process, that was my biggest motivation for creating this is that I hated the whole process and my family and nobody in my community knew how to do this because everybody was like engineers or doctors or IT people or business people. So like, this is my form of revenge. So I will most happily help you like hack the process so that I can get back at it. So, Thank you, brother Mahmood. You actually set me up perfectly for uh, the next question I had, uh, which is, what was your what were your processes for choosing law schools you wanted to apply to? Like you said, uh, there's the T14 and the assumption that T14 leads you to big law. Is it important to choose a school based on your career or practice preferences? Uh, Brother Adil, if you could. I, you know, it does. Um, I did not go uh, T14. I did end up at a big law. I'm very happy I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's quite a few, um, you know, when you get into the, the, the real world, I'll say, quote unquote, um, absolutely nobody cares where you went to school at all. Nobody even asks. Absolutely. The only reason it ever comes up is because people think it's funny that I went to Scalia's law school. Um, and <laughs> which is not funny. It's, um, uh, my, it in fact, it somewhat informed the decision-making process. One, I think, it, you know, just as a practical matter, um, you know, just like real estate, location matters. Um, you know, the city you're going to be in, the area you're going to be in. I know we, we do a lot of things virtual now, but um, that was somewhat of a criteria, and especially if you're inclined to be, like, for example, in the D.C. area, you know, there's lobbying, there's firms, there's public interest, everyone's a lawyer. Um, Boston. Um, uh, I intentionally sought after a school with a different ideology, ideological bend to get a, a different flavor than I was used to getting. I like having um, differences of opinions and different, um, you know, um, frames. So, you know, it's not just all about U.S. News and World Reports. Um, and, you know, you may think you a school is a great fit for you. You know, talk to people that have been there. Um, you know, realize how much. Um, you know, something that I valued actually was big fish, small pond syndrome. I wanted a school that was, you know, had fewer students that I could get more access to, and it would help me stand out a lot more than you know other places. You know, th those other things factor into it quite a bit. So do some research. Thank you for that deal. Honestly, really just came down to, I don't know if you guys hear a baby screaming, that's my other niece, I apologize. Um, but it was a financial decision for me. Like I didn't love my school necessarily, um, but they gave me a full ride and a stipend and being Canadian, I didn't qualify for any student loans going to an American school, couldn't take out uh, private loans. Um, parents don't have 100K in the bank each year that I need for law school. So it was... Um, I did get into two T14s off waitlist, but there was no money left at that point. So I just decided to, uh, you know, like try my chances, be myself, know that I could use my skill set to take what I need out of the experience. Like it's not always, um, it's re remembering that you're there for an experience and situating yourself so that you can give yourself that experience. Um, I TA'd with professors that I really cared about or whose classes I really cared about or who wrote law review articles that I really cared about. Um, and I, when you go to a not like a non T14 school or like a lower tiered school, um, you have not, I don't wanna say less competition, but when you have, cause I like students at my school were like cutthroat stealing exams, parents writing their briefs, like absolutely insane. I thought I would avoid that because I wasn't at a T14, but nope, they're all crazy. <laughs> um, I, there's sometimes when you're at a lower tier school, people are only there to make it to the top 15 or top 20% so that they can get that big law job. People in my school, at least the top quarter are all in big law. So that's still definitely possible if you're at a lower tier school. I don't know why you'd want to be in big law, but <laughs> to each their own. Um, but 
I, professors look for unique students. Um, when you're at a bigger school, you're going to have um, a harder time, I guess, building that relationship with a professor because there are so many students, not enough time. Um, my con law professors is like, professors like one of my favorite people, my criminal procedure professor, we text regularly, sends me cases that he wants me to read. I'm in IP, I have nothing to do with either of those courses, but they also help me work on an independent study that looks at how um, copyright infringement could potentially be a civil rights issue. Um, and it's understanding that you just wanna be in a place where you can really um, be your full self and get everything that you need to set yourself up for the next stage of life because law school ends. You're not gonna be able to name drop the law school. You, I mean, maybe you actually can name drop the law school that you went to for a while, but what matters is the connections that you build and what you come out with um, and the relations, relationships that you build with your classmates and your professors and um, the people, uh, the alumni at your school. So picking a law school, I feel is so ridiculously subjective to where somebody's at and like where they want to go. Um, like, I, I don't know, for, for example, if you wanted to practice in the city of Houston, I think the University of Houston Law School is like a phenomenal place to go. Even though I grew up in the Northeast, I grew up in like Massachusetts, Connecticut area. I'd never heard about the University of Houston, like up here, right? Um, but when I was working down in Houston this past summer, like everybody that I was working with was a University of Houston grad. Like they're all talking about like their times at University of Houston, like, it's not a super hard school to get into, but I think just because of its location or like what it is, it just like really dominates in that particular market. Um, just like uh, Avila was talking about, like if you want to really work in DC, like George Washington, another school like really dominates in that market. So uh, I think it's super subjective. For me personally, how I chose my school is that again, I knew that as somebody who was disabled, um, people, would be less willing to give me a chance or automatically believe that I was less capable. So for me, I thought that the branding would be really necessary to have behind me to support me and to like kind of help uh, push my career forward. And, um, you know, I guess like make my resume a little bit more acceptable uh, on somebody's desk. So that's why I personally decided to go to like a large brand school and while I was forgetting to go to like a really large brand school. Uh, it's even like why I transferred my undergrads as well. It's just because like I was at a smaller school initially in my undergrad, but I was like, you know what? Like, I think for me, like the branding is gonna be really important because I like, you know, I'm already starting off a mile behind in this race you call life. Um, and though I was expecting to come in and be really, un I was expecting to be super uncomfortable at Harvard Law. Um, I was thought it was gonna be like a bunch of chats and like frat boys and like all this different kind of stuff. And I walk in like my first day of orientation and uh, two people on wheelchairs like went by me. And I was like, whoa, like this is the first time I've ever like not been the only visibly, be visibly disabled person in the room. So I thought that was really interesting. Like just in my class, I think there's like two wheelchair users. Like that's all I've been able to notice so far, but like, I thought that was pretty cool. My class is 56% um, non-white. Uh, my class is 54% women, right? So uh, I, I've just actually found it to be like actually a pretty cool experience in regards to how diverse it is. Um, I guess probably a few years ago, it wasn't that way. So initially I was pretty intimidated to go to a large brand name school, but so far I've, I've found it to be really awesome. And like all my professors so far have seemed to be really cool. And they like spend most of their time talking about how like, corrupt and horrible the justice system is which again I was not expecting so like it's it's just it's it's been a pleasant surprise so thank you so much brother Mahmoud. uh uh I have a few more questions left uh the next of them being uh what sorts of things did you do before you applied to law school to make you more competitive quote unquote competitive uh as in in terms of internship I know Sister Iman spoke a little bit about uh, journalism and uh, fashion. So what, what kinds of things do you all think makes you a competitive candidate, if there are any at all? Uh, Brother Adil? Yeah, I mean, I think being yourself and 
doing the things that you're more interested in doing. Um, yeah, I half laugh because I was MSA president, so that's probably cliche. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was cliche, but um, no, I had actually gotten into law school um, like before that probably even happened, or I, I don't think I had any real factor um, in it whatsoever. Um, if you're an athlete, go, um, you know, join club sports, uh, you know, do something that you're passionate about doing there. If you're, you know, into fitness, you know, start a class. Um, if you're into art, paint, draw, write, do, do something that is not required of you. Don't think, oh, I need to join this club or I need to do this, um, you know, because it'll help me or don't do this because I think it'll hurt me. Um, more than anything else, I think most people find people that are interesting, who are authentic and do the things that they like to do. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is probably the best advice that I can give there, because I don't want anyone to think, you know, they're, okay, I'm going to go out and now, you know, start a podcast, even though I don't know anything about podcasts, <laughs> or, you know, start growing a vegetable garden, um, if you don't like vegetables. Um, and don't have a garden. Um, you don't need to. You don't need to do all those different types of things. But um, you know, everyone surely has something that they find interesting um, that they want to do, and you know, can go out in that direction. Thank you, brother Adil. Sister Iman. Um, brother Adil, I love that you brought up. You mentioned podcasts and vegetable gardens because I'm starting a podcast called Hijabi in the City, and I actually have a vegetable garden. <laughs> I love plants, love growing things, grew up on a farm, so it all fits. Um, but that was not for law school to recover from law school, really. Um, I had no intention of going to law school, so I didn't do anything to kind of prepare myself. I just, when you do things with passion, I think that's a lot more important and a lot more helpful for your application than like the generic uh, debate club. Although I was in debate club, but I just, I like arguing. <laughs> um, uh, I think what has helped me like the OCI process, like so on-campus interviews when you're um, a 1L for your 2L, for your 2L summer um, and like interviews in general is having a resume that starts conversation. Um, I got an interview at a law firm that flat out does not ever hire first year associates like they hire like after you've been practicing for three or four years and it's like the only firm I'd ever want to work for um, they do copyright and IP in like a way that I just find really interesting um, and they interviewed me specifically because of the tech that I'm building and like they didn't offer me the job but <laughs> the managing partner has been emailing me regularly just to, like stay in touch so, like still relationship building um, and aside from like in fashion and journalism I'm a yoga teacher and like I do like every year I go on like a wellness retreat like I'm very not the typical law student it's all of those things have come up in any interviews that I've had um they want to know that you're a real person right and that you are someone who has a personality and an identity and you're not just trying to like fill a role um from mentors who are partners at law firms all of them have also said like they want to hire the person that they can be up until three o'clock in the morning working on a case. If they don't want to be with a weirdo who has no personality and kind of like wants to fit into like a cookie cutter mold, um, be yourself. Um, you've gotten your, you've gotten here this far. Um, you've got being you has gotten you here this far. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and yeah, like just do the things that make you happy because you're gonna need you're gonna need those happy things when you're in law school. Inshallah, that you inshallah you all go. Thank you, Sister Imam, Brother Mahmoud. Yeah, um, I guess my tip would be like, look for really cool and interesting ideas and whatever you think looks the scariest and like, it's probably like what your gut says you shouldn't do, go and do it. <laughs> Cause like, I just feel like that makes you like a really like interesting person. Like I had an opportunity to go to like Alabama and like uh, we were like solidifying the relationship between the NAACP and the NFB, which is like the National Federation of the Blind. And everybody knows who the NAACP is because like Alabama's last state in America um, to lynch a black man and it was also the last state in America to require blind people to get sterilized to be able to receive government uh, assistance so like and there was huge amount of resistance um, to this happening 
Um, and like, I remember landing in Alabama and just being like freaked out the whole time being like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Like what situation did I put myself in? But like, I don't know. I just feel like that has really, you know, like do things that when you meet your end, you know, and you're taking your last breaths, you can be like, wow, I had a really fulfilling life. I'm like, I got to do some really cool stuff. Um, and you know, like, so, uh, yeah, I guess like, that's the, that's the best way I can say it. Just like do interesting, cool stuff. If you have two choices and like something just seems like easier and generic, don't do it. Do the thing that seems crazy, you know? Thank you, brother Mahmoud. Uh, Going off what uh, Brother Adil said earlier about uh, he, Brother Adil, you mentioned that a mentor was really resourceful for you uh, earlier on in your application. Uh, I'd like to ask what resources did you find helpful during your law school admissions process? Uh, Brother Adil, you could weigh in on that first. Yeah, um, I, we also have a vegetable garden, but I was, I can't grow vegetables um <laughs> so i'm not knocking it um the kids pull out carrots um and, and eat them um i i your entire life i can't stress this enough will uh you will benefit from having good mentors and people that will open doors for you you're, you're gonna find i know there's a good saying out there there's people that close doors and there's people that open them and surround yourself around people that open them because you will find people that try to close them um uh i am an advocate although i don't think it's 100 percent essential of the test prep process just having been a part of it um been a part of the course design as well um because you know for better or worse these are standardized tests and they do have formulas and tricks um and you know it, it is a tough resource and it is a, t um, a money investment but i think you know i, I used to tell students all the time you know you're probably going to pay upwards of two three hundred thousand dollars for law school so you know think of this as you know a couple thousand dollars in uh, a pocket and if you do a good job you know you um like uh iman was saying um, you, you know, I'd echo that too. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to go to school for free. Um, you know, that makes a huge difference and, you know, deciding where to go. So those early investments are the ones, um, that'll pay off, uh, in the long run, but, you know, find, um, you know, other people that, uh, you know, are doing things that they're passionate about and trying to learn what motivates them. Um, and, you know, they'll give you the guidance. Um, almost everything that I'm probably saying today or others will tell you, I can hear people in my life telling me that, hey, you know, go to a, um, you know, go to school in a city that you want to work in, um, go to a place that, you know, you'll feel comfortable living in for a long time. Um, hey, you might be good at this. You should try it. You know, people will say that to you in your life. Um, and, you know, even if you want to do this, you know, if you talked to me beforehand, I would want to want to have been a sports agent. And I'm really glad I didn't do that because I realized that's like transactional contract work, which more power to you if you want to do that, but not that much power because that seems not that fun to me. <laughs> um, and the last thing in the world I'd want to do is be doing criminal defense, particularly federal criminal defense. Um, and I can't imagine doing anything else. So, um, you know, there you know, some of the formal, um, you know, Kaplan, you know, things like that, your undergraduate schools, you know, um, you know, those admission counselors, they're helpful, um, but people will be more helpful to you in the long run, especially the networks here. So, you know, come back to the other series, you know, get to know the people in AMBA and APSA, um, you know, it, it'll be helpful to you in the long run. Thank you, Brother Adil, uh, Sister Iman. Um, can you the question again? I just want to make sure I'm answering more directly because yeah. I feel like I've been. Uh, it was what resources did you find helpful during your law school admission process? So I, I feel like my answer would be best if I answer the things that were not helpful. <laughs> um, you know, like all those like messaging boards. I don't know if they, if you guys were on them or anything. But like the 
T14 law school ones that like talk about people's grades. Yeah. Oh my God, don't do that. That's don't go on Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> horrible, horrible experience. Yeah. Don't do things that are going to make you feel bad. Like we don't, you know, the person behind the keyboard with the 4.0 and 180 is probably maybe lying. Maybe also a terrible person. You don't really know, but it makes you feel awful about yourself because you, that kind of forces you to set yourself up because you don't think you have a chance because you're seeing all these people who are talking about these grades that are nowhere close to what you have, right? Um, but there's no, like, discernment is difficult online. You don't know what's real and what isn't. And why engage in an environment when you're already studying for a stressful exam that just makes you feel terrible about yourself. Um, also kind of know what you want and what's important to you before you ask for advice. Um, there's a lot of, we all have well-meaning people in our life, alhamdulillah, um, but sometimes people are giving you advice based on what's best for them instead of really looking at who you are as a person. Um, I truly believe that like all of us have like a divine purpose um, and that like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us gifts to like work towards um, the purpose that we're supposed to serve here. Um, so when you're constantly taking other people's advice and not checking in with yourself, you do yourself a disservice by not living, this is gonna sound very new agey, but not living in alignment with like the purpose that you're meant to serve. Um, so as often as you ask mentors and like elders in community and like lawyers that you know for their thoughts and opinions, also be checking in with yourself and really sit with yourself and ask what feels right, what feels good. Um, and just, stay away from anything that makes you feel not great is really like my big my big picture message thank you sister man just a side note uh i'll take that advice i've been all over reddit ever since i even considered going to law school but <laughs> reddit even like for, toxic. Yeah. Yeah. It's horrible it, even like talking about like because i wanted to transfer to a different school after my first year um looking at like transfer admissions and people like asking like a chance me type thing like you think I'd get in it's like people are just so mean like it's like I don't want to be cyber bullied please leave me alone I'm just gonna like send in my application and figure this out on my own so yeah not great I, I would say though um that reddit can be really helpful but you have to go in with your blinders on like go in and get what you need and then leave I was walking into this one law school interview and I looked it up real quick on reddit and every single interview question word for word was on Reddit. Um, so it really came in clutch in that scenario because I was like incredibly prepared and they sent me like a handwritten letter. I mean, kind of funny because I can't read a handwritten letter, but they sent me like a handwritten letter to my parents' house and like they read it to me, but like, because they were just like, wow. And it's just like, well, I just went on Reddit and like read your interview questions. Obviously I didn't tell them that, but um, resources I use, mentor, mentor, mentor. Uh, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but none of us are incredibly unique. This is why I always love to tell blind students because they always feel like they're struggling in their own situation. And the only reason why I tell you you're not unique is because whatever you're going through, I guarantee somebody has probably gone through something similar enough that they have the answer. Um, so like, Either we can give you the answer or we can find somebody who can get you the answer. So mentors, definitely don't reinvent the wheel. People have already figured everything out. Don't figure out the process on your own. Like you're wasting your time, energy, and effort doing that. Um, so definitely mentorship. Uh, Han Academy for LSAT prep. Kaplan for LSAT prep. Uh, and then, yeah, I would say those are probably the biggest resources that I use. Uh, was mentorship, Khan Academy, and Kaplan. And Thank you again, so much, if brother. People are struggling to access Kaplan. Like, there's different ways. Like, I have a lot of friends who are able to access Kaplan for free um, through, like, either they were able to get certificates through their schools or they apply to, like, law firm scholarships or, like, different ways out there. I, I personally believe, like, we're not sponsored by Kaplan or anything, but I do personally believe that. Um, they have some resources on their website that are just pure, absolute gold. So, Thank you so much, Brother Mahmood. Uh, we're nearing 7.30. I don't want to keep uh, our panelists longer than uh, we had asked, but thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insight on this topic today. I'm sure uh, everyone learned a plethora about everything that we discussed today. 
uh, I know now not to go onto Reddit and uh, other forums as well. So thank you so much for everything. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, conclude the event. Thank you, Brother Adil. Thank you, Sister Iman. Thank you, Brother Mahmoud again. And Thanks, Mir. And then Mir, again, and everybody who's like, uh, you know, visiting this event, please, please, please reach out. Like, I'm more than happy to help you. We have so many people. If you're not comfortable working with me, um, we have other people that you can also work with as well. Uh, so please, please reach out. Like, we're more than happy. We would love to give back. Like, you just need to reach out to us. So. And also, I'd just like to quickly add, there is a section on AMBA's website, uh, which walks you through the law school application process. It's sort of a law school application guide. So definitely take a look at that. And as Brother Mahmood said, uh, you could reach out and send an email on the one that was just sent on the chat uh, if you have any questions along with that. But thank you so much for coming in today and we hope to see you at our next event, inshallah. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.